so we had fun last week um, making maps with Tableau, and we we focused really on just learning how to do it. We didn't talk too much about the conventions, but this week we're kind of rewinding back to mapping, this time to take a critical look at the conventions of mapping, how they came to be, why we use them, and what kind of politics they embody. In your reading, um, there are a few things I wanted you to look out for and to focus on. Um, to put it very briefly, um, I want you to think about how our mapping conventions are not inevitable, but in fact the result of particular political arrangements. And these arrangements, which are centuries old, um, have not disappeared. In fact, they've become built into the technical components of the GIS software that we use today. Um, and so it's worth thinking about how we might um, play with those conventions, push against them, um, and, and think critically about them in our own digital humanities projects. Now, you may not have the technical skill yet to build projects that are able to do that, but it's still something that I think is worth thinking about. Um, and I also think that when we consider mapping, it's worth uh, returning to a story from Jorge Luis Borges about mapping. You may have heard this before, but I'm going to read it for you anyway. Um, so Borges writes, in that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city and the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those in unconscionable maps no longer satisfied and the cartographer's guild stuck to a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire and which coincided point for point with it. The following generations, who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been, saw that the vast map was useless, and not without some pitilessness was it that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winters. In the deserts of the west still today, there are tattered ruins of that map, inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land, there is no other relic of the disciplines of geography. So in this Borges vignette, um, the cartographers were so determined to create an accurate and detailed map that they created, in fact, a map that was the size of the terrain it was supposed to depict. And in fact, this would be the only way, right, to, to create a map that was as detailed as, as the terrain itself. Um, you would have to build a map the same size of 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 the land. And so the Borges story, I think, gets at the fact that when we map, we're always holding two impulses in the balance. Uh, on the one hand, we have a desire for completeness, um, for containing as much or conveying as much detail and um, accuracy as possible. And on the other hand, we have a desire for legibility because a map can't be useful if it's truly complete. It would be like Borges's giant map. And because we have to make those kinds of decisions um, about how to make maps legible and which details to leave in and which to leave out, every map tells us not only about the land it surveys, but also about our own culture and intentions. And there are several ways we might begin to look at maps in order to help expose the ways in which they embody ideology and power. And the first is the Cartesian coordinate system in which you locate places using a grid that spans the globe. And you've used this if you've ever thought about latitude and longitude. Um, points are located uh, on a precise kind of net of, um, of lines that span the entire globe. Um, well, this was developed by Ptolemy in the second century AD, um, who pioneered what's called perspective projection, uh, which means um, viewing a map from a finite distance. So with, with perspective projection, you're sort of hovering over the land and um, viewing it as though you're at one point in space. Um, and then he also uh, introduced a system of coordinates for locating features. 
uh, assigning coordinates to all the places and geographic features that he knew in this grid that spanned the globe, which we still use when we talk about latitude and longitude. And so to use Cartesian coordinates, you have to imagine that you're viewing um, the land from a fixed point in space. And that is so familiar to us that we rarely pause to think about it. But in fact, um, it, we almost never actually look at land um, from a fixed point in space. It's just the way we've come to depict uh, geography. It's also worth thinking about the fact that the 16th century in Europe saw a real resurgence of interest in mapping. Why? Because it was a time of exploration and the expansion of empire. And maps are necessary if you want to divide up and control land, and of course if you want to navigate the sea. Um, and the 16th century was also when we saw the uh, introduction of the Mercator projection in 1527. Um, and the Mercator projection is probably the most familiar um, depiction of the Earth um, that we learn about in schools and such. Um, and so in the Mercator projection, the size of land masses are secondary to straight lines to, to the grid system and to mathematical precision. And you'll notice, of course, that Britain and Europe appear extremely large, uh, deceptively large, in fact, compared with the rest of the world. So this projection, this Mercator projection, is good for nautical purposes because it helps sailors measure out um, their routes. But for actually understanding the size of land masses, uh, it's, it's really quite um, deceptive. So it's worth thinking about why we came to embrace this particular projection, what it says about us that we're more interested in um, mathematical precision, apparently, than we are in um, the reality of the land masses themselves. And another way that um, I find useful to um, challenge myself to think about some of the conventions of mapping is to look at other kinds of maps, so non-Eurocentric maps. Um, for example, uh, here's a map of Tokyo that um, from our point of view, or Kyoto, I'm sorry, that from our point of view might look kind of distorted. You'll see that um, the shapes of the mountains uh, seem kind of strangely uh, large and small depending on where you are. Well, the reason for that is this map is actually an enormous map that was meant to be laid on the floor. And then um, observers would actually stand around the map and view it from a multitude of angles. So it's not using that fixed point of space that, that we're used to seeing. Um, and as a result, it looks distorted to our eyes. These maps are uh, really incredible, and I'll include a link so that you can see some of these enormous uh, Japanese maps. And another kind of map which you'll actually encounter in your reading is an Aus Australian Aboriginal map, um, which is more or less illegible to someone who's not familiar with the terrain. So the idea with an Aboriginal map is y you come to know the territory uh, first, and only then can you make sense of the map itself. Um, unlike um, something like a perspective projection where the entire globe is laid out for an independent observer, a very different way of understanding our relationship to land. So some things to think about um, as you uh, work through the readings and the videos this week um, are the ways that maps Eurocentric maps, in any case, privilege objectivity and try to deny subjective or non-scientific ways of understanding space, even though those ways of understanding space may be more accurate to our own experience. Um, they privilege universalism over regional knowledge. Um, and that's why we get these bird's eye views in which every kind of land map mass is subjected to the same coordinate system. And maps have this authority about them, kind of like data visualizations, they tend to give the impression of truthfulness. Maps seem to depict the way things are, um, but as we'll begin to examine together in class, in fact, they embody uh, equally 
our own ideology and political decisions about how to divide up and understand land.